Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series webinar on qualitative approaches for a changing world. My name is Christy Allen. I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenter, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there is a copy of today's presentation along with some white papers. Also, please feel free to ask any questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenter is Clay Detloff, Vice President of Insights and Innovation. Clay has 25 years of experience in both leading and delivering qualitative research. And Roger Wallace, Qualitative Director of Insights and Innovation. He has spent the past 12 years specializing in qualitative research using a variety of traditional and emerging approaches. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Clay. So, thank you, Christy, and thanks to everyone who's participating in this webinar. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the ways we've been using qualitative research in today's marketplace. Life seems to just be getting more complicated as consumers and as researchers. Technology has changed our lives in ways we couldn't have imagined before. We're multitasking, doing more, and the lines are really blurring as to our activities. Given how intricate and often complicated the life of the consumer is now, some of the questions that we have to address are, how do we get to know or re-know our target audiences? How do we find out what they're doing, and how do we influence it ultimately? Let me illustrate this with two personal examples. Um, that have been given to me recently. And over the holiday weekend a couple of weeks ago, we had some beautiful days here in Dallas. And at the back of my yard, I have a little small area with some trees where I often just like to go back and sit and relax. One morning during the weekend, I was up earlier than the rest of my family and just wanted to go outside and enjoy the great looking morning. I walked outside to the back area to relax. I sat outside, kind of enjoyed the morning, um, listening to the birds, had a drink, and after a few minutes, I opened up my iPad and started searching the news sites. After looking at that for a few minutes, I went to Amazon. I had been looking at some camping equipment over the last three or four weeks, kind of going back and forth, should I buy, should I not buy? And just kind of sitting out there in, in the woods or in the trees, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So promptly put in my order and ordered off of Amazon. It was one of those aha moments for me when I realized how I had merged the two activities in my own life, and it seems so commonplace now. My second example actually involves my kids, and who are and from the ages of 15 to about 30. I have married kids and unmarried kids, and they're playing a game now called Pokemon Go. Late at night on the weekends and wherever, people are out looking for these Pokemon characters in locations all around us, and it's really started to catch some press release lately. Last Saturday, uh, my son and his friends, who are all college age, were in a park in a neighboring city looking for these Pokemon. They said they saw about over 100 people running around the park playing this game. If you look at Instagram, you can see people from all over the world chasing Pokemon, whether it's in London or Rome. One of my son's um, uh, told me in an accident his daughter almost had because she was um, around looking for these Pokemon and basically stopped in the middle of the road. You know, if you're driving around now and see someone on their phone, they're probably just as likely to be looking for Pokemon as they are to be on their phone texting or listening and talking to someone. Yep. Interestingly enough, this is an endeavor that's gotten people up off their chairs, though, and couches. They're not playing the game sitting in front of a screen. They're running all around the countryside. And really, from a marketing standpoint, the question is, how do we get people off of their chairs for our products and services? One of the messages we want to convey today is that we probably already know, but it's that the world we used to sell products or services in has changed. And the world we live in today most likely won't be the same tomorrow. To understand the consumer today, we need to approach him or her from multiple directions to better understand the perceptions of the world they live in the decisions they make, what attracts their attention, what products and services they use, and what can get them off their chairs. Over the years, qualitative research has evolved in many ways, and it's still evolving. We as researchers must keep up with the latest trends in our own industry to ensure that we're keeping up with our customers. 
Today, we'll talk about and show a few examples of how to utilize both old and new qualitative research techniques, fusing them together in unique ways to gain a better, more complete understanding of consumers and their perceptions and behaviors. The bulk of our session is going to consist of several case studies that incorporates the use of new techniques along with some more traditional research to help gather insights and solve marketing and business issues. The first case is going to look to develop a deeper understanding of the consumer and their product usage. Second case is going to talk about um, developing new products and it's going to talk about how to use and uh, utilize multiple facets to understand and develop the most appropriate products. In the third section, we're going to be talking about shopper insights um, and how to gain a deeper understanding of the consumer. So we're only going to be covering the three examples. Hopefully this will give you insight as you develop future research. Again, as consumers' lives have evolved and lifestyles have changed, qualitative research has also had to change in order to accurately capture and understand their lives and the relationship to our products and services. Before we talk about how we're trying to better understand the customer, let's just give a few insights into today's consumer lifestyle. Basically, consumers are busier now and have more and more things competing for their time and attention. Life seems to be getting more hectic for everyone, which means we not only have to understand their perceptions, their goals, their concerns and behaviors, but we need to encourage them to give us their time so that we can understand what's going on in their lives. If you look at this graph, other than the things used for work and sleep, most of their product and service usage is happening in an eight-hour window and competing with or involved in a lot of activities that they're trying to cram into a small window of time. A couple of points about this. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics American Time Use Service, a 25 to 54-year-old consumer with children had a full day. On an average day, 85% of women and 67% of men spent some time doing household activities such as housework, cooking, lawn care, or financial and other household management. The share of workers doing some or all of their work at home grew from 19% in 2003, the first year the survey was conducted, to 24% in 2015, and the amount of time that they are working from home has increased. If you're looking for examples of leisure activities, watching TV was a leisure activity that occupied the most time almost three hours, accounting for more than half of leisure time on activities on average. <clears throat> Along with that increase in activity, trying to maintain a balance in their life, consumers seem to be experiencing more stress than ever before. You can see here some of the results of a study conducted by the American Psychological Association. Almost half of the consumers have trouble in balancing that work-life balance. Seems consumers are often looking for ways to reduce their stress in the products and services they choose, and they want less stress in choosing these products and services. Consumers are often wanting to find out, how can you help me? In the context, commerce, and customer, best practices to exceed expectations report from the CMO Council and SAP, the top attributes of a positive customer experience are highlighted in the chart you see. It includes fast response times to issues, needs, or complaints at 75%. Consistency of experience across channels, 56% a knowledgeable staff ready to assist whenever and wherever their customer needs, a person to speak with regardless of time or location, and relevant communications, promotions, recommendations, and products. Okay, so how do we get a better understanding of today's consumers? How do we get a better understanding of the relationship that our customers have with our products and services? And as we are talking about our customers today, these customers really are in a both a B2B sense and a B2B and a B2C sense. We like to call our approach to deeper understanding fusion research or mixed mode research. And fusion research, it really is about putting together a research program that can give a more complete understanding of the consumer by identifying the goals of the study, identifying the sample needed and the strengths and weaknesses of different methodologies. You can often put together or fuse a hybrid research plan that will provide results better than just a single methodology. As consumers lead more complicated lives, it often takes a more comprehensive approach to get the full picture. 
Just as a matter of comparison, we're currently utilizing a fusion research approach in over a third of our research today, while five or six years ago it was less than 10%. It's not we want to be more complicated in our designs, but it's what we need to do to be answer many of our clients' questions. You know, basically, we found it necessary in many research studies just to understand and capture the, the consumer insights from multiple directions. How do we put together the right and a coherent research program to meet the needs? The first step is really to understand the research goals and exactly what you need from the research and then identify the kinds of information needed um, to reach those goals. This step, identifying the information, is really a key piece of developing the good research. Well, often a research objective is stated something along the lines of, why do consumers choose our product over competitive products and services? And often we can default to, um, let's do some focus groups and talk to the consumer. But as we look at the information needed for the objective, we can see that to get the best answer, multiple attack points may be needed. For example, some of the information we may need could include what are other products? How are they using the products? And how do these products fit into their life? What attributes and benefits are they looking for in these products? From our brand and from competitive brands, and how are they shopping for the product? Recognize that every methodology has strengths and weaknesses and have certain sweet spots, if you will, for gaining consumer understanding. Whether they're old traditional methods such as focus groups or some of the newest techniques like app usability or qualitative video snippets from respondents almost in real time, knowing what can be done with the methods or techniques out there helps you to establish a better connection with the consumer. You know, for example, when you think about in-person focus groups, man, they're fantastic methods for understanding multiple aspects of an issue. You're able to bring a lot of people together and to really understand all the different points of view of these issues. But they really don't allow much time for in-depth responses from single individuals. You know, a good rule of thumb when we do focus groups is that for every question a moderator asks, he can get about three responses before moving on to the next question. On the other hand, you see online bulletin boards, and boards are an excellent means for understanding the entire process consumers go through when making decisions, or to get a thorough understanding of the usage or purchase occasions. In an online bulletin board, respondents come in at their own convenience, and because of that, they're able to spend the time that they want to and, and go back and forth into the session. What we really find is when we want to understand that process that people go through, Boards are a great way to do that, as are um, typical um, IDI interviews. But again, knowing what those strengths and weaknesses are lets you pick the right board, the right methodology, and the right technique. You know, everyone is now connected, it seems, and the advent of cell phones also enables us to get qualitative insights anytime and any place. It's great for understanding those in the moment occasions, but in depth responses are harder to get in this venue. It's truly understanding what the strengths and weaknesses of each of these methodologies are. As we go through today's case studies, we hope you see that there's a great opportunity through fusion research to really get a more complete understanding of today's customers. I'm going to turn the time now over to Roger for our first case study. Thanks, Clay. Um, this first case study is part of a new product development process that began a few years ago. Uh, when we were working with our client on, on early concept stages. Uh, now that the working prototype is ready, the client needs to capture these user experiences so they can strengthen this new product before launching it. So, uh, you know, this one just wrapped up in the field, so we really have had to strip out all identifying information. But it, it does give you an idea of how different techniques and approaches are fused together to help accomplish a goal. Our client's a major home products company, uh, and they're developing a new product uh, that is a little bit more um, involved in, than their current portfolio. So they really wanted to get that learning. Um, they took the learning from our earlier research and used it to make a functioning prototype to be used for evaluation, both from an installation standpoint and from actual usage of the product. And so understanding this experience is essential to determining how the product can be approved. Um, another role, uh, a budget played a factor here, uh, as it can often do. 
we weren't able to necessarily camp out each of the homes and observe all the experiences, nor uh, would we necessarily want to. So what we did, um, we had two general areas we wanted to look at, installation and usage. The installation was a bit more complicated because it involved multiple professionals, contractors, subcontractors, as well as homeowners uh, who were in the home watching the install. We really wanted to understand how this installation experience works or didn't work from a profession, professional's perspective and also from the homeowner's perspective. So we conducted in-home interviews and observations of the installation experience. We were not present at all of the installation occasions. Uh, we observed about a third of the installations in person. The others were captured through telephone interviews with professionals once they completed all the installations. Um, once the product was installed and ready to go, we then evaluated the usage, not only by the homeowner, but from other users in the house. We needed to gather what everyone thought about using the product, how it performed, where it fell short, how their behaviors changed or not, and how their routines changed or not when using the product. So we conducted online form interviews from our, and from this platform, it allowed us to collect experiences while, you know, while also prompting participants to do certain tasks, uh, which could include various usage scenarios to get their reactions about specific features or functions or whatever we wanted them to, to try out or do. Uh, and this was all captured virtually through uh, form interviews with videos and pictures of their usage captured over an extended period of time. Uh, this next slide shows a little bit about the process and the complexity of the project. Uh, we were interacting with multiple targets at different times during the installation and usage process. Before the installation occurred, we conducted both in-person interviews and virtual interviews with homeowners and on-site interviews with professionals to gather baseline background information, current situation, preferences, you know, what their expectations were about the install. And then once the installation actually began, we then conducted the uh, on-site observational in-person interviews to take a look at how it works. Uh, in the cases where we were not present, we captured that experience from the professionals during telephone interviews and in virtual forums for homeowners. Um, so once everything was installed, the usage period began and we wanted to observe that over an extended period of time. Uh, we had a handful of participants where we conducted in-person interviews during this period, but for the bulk of participants, we conducted these through online forums. Uh, so we can capture that experience virtually uh, with journal entries, uh, and they were coupled with pictures and videos of the experience, uh, and respondents were reporting on things that they liked, things they did not like, things that surprised them or frustrated them, and so on. Anything about their experience uh, we wanted to hear. Um, we also captured the first time they actually turned on and used the product to get their initial reactions and then, of course, uh, how they used it over time and how that changed or altered. At the conclusion of their usage period, we conducted a final online forum. Um, one thing to note is this work in the participants' home was part of a remodel project. So this timeline represents kind of one person. Um, and so when you multiply that with a dozen or two dozen participants, all with varying degrees of time frames uh, and pacing and, and experiences, we really needed an approach that allowed us to be there at the right time to capture the, the need to learn from, from each of these people. So for the learnings on this project, um, we organized the insights into three key buckets, really. Um, the, the issues or changes that must be addressed before launch, the, the issues that need to be addressed but aren't necessarily critical um, before product launch. And then uh, the last bucket of some issues or suggestions on how it could be enhanced for future product versions. Uh, so this, this helps guide the client on uh, how to strengthen the product before launch and also for uh, future iterations. Another learning is the extended engagement of this approach it helped us to build relationships with participants helped us to establish rapport and build a trust with respondents to, to feel more comfortable opening up and sharing their thoughts and also their critical thinking about the experience. You know, we, we definitely wanted to hear the good and bad and ugly of, of, every, of every part of their, uh, their experience. So this technique of using multiple approaches across several targets 
across an extended time allowed us to gather the needed insights to strengthen this new product uh, before the launch and, and meet our clients' research needs. So I'll turn it over to Clay to walk us through the next case study. Thanks, Roger. The next case is going to review concept development type research where we use multiple qualitative methods. The research was a multinational <clears throat> effort that wanted to understand commonalities and differences young mother, among young mothers across the globe. Concept development is interesting in that the starting place for this type of research can vary greatly. You know, it can be influenced by existing knowledge of the target market as well as company goals, interests, and capabilities. In reality, concept development work can be very open-ended or kind of sky's the limit effort or a very focused initiative where, for example, you want to add a new SKU or product variant to an existing brand. The goal of the research was really going to talk about very open-ended aspects and was designed to understand young mothers, their routines, issues, and daily challenges. Ultimately, research was intended to identify the unmet needs among the young moms um, and begin the process of developing solutions to address those needs really regardless of the category. And in order to best meet the goals of the research, decision analysts recommended a four-phase research approach, each phase providing unique insights with specific objectives. You know, really each phase working with and kind of building upon the others to help to really develop that consumer relevant concepts. We felt, we felt the research was successful for many reasons, including the ability to capture insights by being present at that point of emotion. Um, transforming those insights into the development platforms, collaborating with the community of innovative consumers to create new product concepts based on the development platforms, and validating the appeal of the concepts with prospective consumers. You know, looking at the research itself, phase one was truly exploratory in nature. It was comprised of in-person focus groups to identify those issues relevant to moms and understand really the ways they talked about and kind of bucketed their day. Phase two consisted of online bulletin boards with another set of young mothers. These boards lasted several days and were designed to really get a better understanding of their day-to-day -day life, the things they do, the products they use, and the decision processes new mothers go through. Phase three was a session with respondents who have been tested and are identified as creative in order to develop concepts that would help young moms with the challenges that they encounter. And input from the first two phases helped to identify those areas needing help. Finally, phase four went back to the group of young mothers with a series of online web camera focus groups, really to kind of vet and refine the concepts prior to quantitative assessment, and really to see if there's any sticking power to the concepts that were developed in the ideation process. In phase one, we really wanted to talk to young mothers and see what was going on in their lives and how they talked about their lives and the issues they face. In essence, understanding the challenges of a young mother. Focus groups were deemed to be an excellent first step and they were designed to understand the relevant issues and provide really kind of the rails and boundaries for the remainder of the research efforts. Some of the reasons for starting with focus groups were it gave us the ability to talk to eight to 10 people at one time. You know, focus groups are an ideal exploratory method for initial research as they serve to uncover most of those issues that are relevant and the supporting top of mind beliefs and attitudes. Group interaction tends to create more energy, we found, and respondents are often motivated to kind of dig deeper, if you will, in the company of peers and in reactions to others' comments, really helping to bring out all of those issues that are important to people. And this approach established a baseline understanding of the language used by the consumer. What we found in the groups was that the young mothers talked about the challenges of their lives in the context of four key areas. The first area was the start of their day, how they began their day now that they were a new mother, and what challenges they faced now that they were, talking, that they were taking care of a young kid. The second area most of the mothers talked about was literally the opposite end of the day, when they were winding down, how their routines had changed at this time now that they were a new mom and responsible for others. Kind of between these two bookends, if you will, were two other occasions or situations that were challenging for these young moms. The first was the trade-offs they now had to make in taking care of their new child, in addition to taking care of their other family members, interacting with their spouse, taking care of their homes, or whatever else came up. And finally, the fourth challenging area for these mothers was just leaving the home, going out and taking their new baby with them.
Second phase was designed to explore more in depth the four challenge areas that had been identified in the first phase. In this phase, we recruited respondents to an online bulletin board that ran over the course of a week. One of the benefits of the bulletin board approach is that we were able to conduct the boards in several different countries simultaneously in the native language of that country. In this phase, respondents were able to come in at their own convenience and record thoughts and perceptions close to the time they actually occurred. You know, the bulletin board enabled us to have a running diary, basically, of what was going on in their lives, specifically during the four occasions identified. The diary aspect took the form of both written responses and video entrees. As part of the um, bulletin boards, we had respondents record through images those times when they left the home for different activities. We had them take pictures of their home and the products they used during the different times. And as part of these activities, we concentrated on white spaces as well as the concerns and problems they had with products during those times. During the bulletin board, certain areas of interest arose with some respondents, and we were able to bring them into a breakout chat sessions to conduct a deeper dive and get a better grasp of the issue. For example, some respondents expressed a challenge with the clean smell in the baby's room, and we were able to bring out a small sample to ask what they meant by the idea and to understand what they felt the cause was, how they dealt with it, and how they were able to improve and, and develop a better smell within that um, child's room. After analyzing the research, we really kind of identified several need states or product development areas that would be very beneficial to these young mothers. The development platform I'm showing here is called it's I Come Last, and it really can be summed up by the comment of one young mother from Brazil who said, because of the time it takes, I'm always the last one to get ready. I'm not a priority anymore. My kids are. Basically, the opportunity we have here is to create a solution that makes busy mothers feel cared for without taking time away from their families. Some of the drivers for this opportunity were that moms take care of their children first, then their spouses and homes, and finally themselves. Often they're going to forego even doing the most basic things, eating, personal care, and appearance-related activities. Interestingly, though, they accept this as part of being a mother and aren't upset about it, but they do wish they had a bit more time for themselves. Another potential product development area that arose centered around the theme, I'm cleaning my never-ending task. It's kind of it's captured by a comment from a mother from the UK who said, I hate housework. It's never-ending. As soon as you've done, it needs doing again. You know, this area can be encompassed by the following areas. Moms are the primary, in some cases, only person responsible for cleaning. You know, to keep things manageable, they clean a little at a time, so the entire home is seldom completely clean. They want a clean home. Germs are a particular concern when small children are in the home, and they would welcome help, especially if they could have the confidence that cleaning would be well done. So again, it's just giving two different platforms or development platforms, if you will, that new products could be developed from. Once we had these boundaries established to help guide product concept development, we used our imaginator group, and we set to work, come up with some potential concepts within each of the development areas. In this phase, we conducted an ideation session with members of our creative community, and it lasted approximately two days. Though we often use our creative community in online activities, these particular sessions were conducted in person. And over the course of the two days, multiple concepts for each development area were produced in conjunction with members of our insights team, as well as the international research team from the client. And really, the last step in the qualitative process before it goes to quantitative validation was a series of online web camera focus groups where we presented the concepts to another set of young moms to get their impressions of the concepts and refine them if needed. Online focus groups are much like traditional focus groups, but usually with a somewhat smaller sample. Personally, we like to have about four or five respondents in each of our online web camera sessions. You know, though not as able as traditional focus groups in a purely exploratory sense, Online web camera running views are really good for showing concepts to a group of people across large geographic areas and obtaining their impressions of them. You know, in this format, we were able to take the concepts, identify four that we wanted to move forward with in quantitative validation, and slightly refine them to better meet our young mother's expectations and needs. Results from the quantitative concept testing showed that in the I Come Last area, there was a new skin cream or moisturizer. And it had a 29% purchase intent score in the UK and a 12% purchase score in the US. Again, the ability to use multiple phases to really understand all of the issues, 
all of the relevant issues and to build upon each phase to give the best concepts that were possible. Now I'm going to turn the time back over to Roger for our last case. All right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, for this last one, um, we'll talk about shopper insights. And I think we all can agree the, the shopper and their preferences and needs and all the things that they want, not only from a rational decision-making standpoint, but also the, the emotional drivers that, that influence those decisions. Is, is really more and more important uh, for all our clients who are competing for you know, the same consumer dollar and loyalty. Um, we had a major retailer. Uh, they wanted to revitalize and refresh their brand and update their image from in-store experiences to the products and brands offered and how things are situated or organized and merchandised. Uh, they, they wanted to get an evaluation on everything about the shopping experience so they could figure out how they could transform and shape this consumer experience uh, in their stores to ultimately create increased traffic and, and loyalty. Um, so a few things uh, led us to a hybrid or fusion approach. Uh, one is our client wanted to follow consumers on their normal shopping experience in several markets throughout the country. We also had to take into account that the shopping, as Clay mentioned in uh, one of his opening examples, is, is more multifaceted than it than has, been, has ever been before. Um, you know, we go to brick and mortar stores, but we also shop online, and now we use apps for shopping. And there may be a new avenue or channel for that to occur, but that's kind of, it's, it's very, very uh, changing. Uh, and our client wanted to understand this and understand, have a comprehensive look of this shopping experience not just the in-store experience, but how the online experience matched uh, or didn't match and where it could be improved. And so, you know, for this project as well, there, were, there wasn't an endless budget, something we, we all have to contend with. Um, you know, we, we also had to conduct this during one of the busiest times of the year, uh, the holiday shopping season, when people are even more time stressed uh, than they, they are usually. So it was important that we were able to find ways to reach these shoppers during this busy time. So what we did here is we had a combination of three different techniques to help us drive in, uh, dive in and understand the shopping experience. The first was the online form interviews. Uh, and this was the key platform that allowed us to do other things. Everybody started with the online form interviews to share their relevant background, experiences, preferences, attitudes, all those things before we sent them on a shopping experience. We really needed to understand you know, where they were coming from and their current preferences before sending them out. Um, we then used the platform to prompt them to do other things and capture this experience uh, through virtual shopping or virtual approach. We asked them to go shop at specific stores, record, uh, and take pictures of their experience. Uh, also during the recordings, we asked them to think aloud while they, uh, while they were recording, telling us what's going through their mind, what they are experiencing, what they liked or didn't like. Uh, then they would upload uh, all their pictures and videos from their experiences to the forum. Um, so we, we were really, and we, we asked questions, and they um, you know, gave us additional details on that forum, and, and we were able to to virtually be in the store, uh, allowing for an unbiased, non-intrusive experience. And they recorded and told us about the things that were most important to them. So it was really a great way of seeing what they see, going through the same time and expense, or without having to go through that time and expense of, of being there. Uh, the last thing we utilized was remote usability. Uh, and we've used this uh, platform and technique for website usability in the past, from early development stage all the way to pre-launch research. Uh, but we also use it to look at behaviors and preferences for online shopping. The great thing about this is they don't have to go to a centrally located facility to participate. They take part from their own computer or laptop in their home or office, the same one they're comfortable with using in their normal environment. The way it works is uh, we schedule a time, set up a telephone call where participants give us permission to share their desktop allowing us to see their movements and where they go and click. We ask them to do certain tasks or scenarios, such as shop for a purse or a gift or a tool. Then we ask them to shop as they normally would, and as they do that, we watch what they do first, what they do next, and so on. We also ask them to think aloud while doing their tasks. We want to hear what's running through their mind while they're doing this and going through this experience uh, to attain kind of a 
stream of conscious thinking uh, of what they're doing, what they're looking at, what they're looking for, uh, what they're trying to do. Sometimes, you know, we all have these workarounds. We've all been using websites for years, and we have workarounds that we do so quickly uh, that sometimes we're not even aware of it. So hearing what they're trying to do or what they're, they're looking for is real helpful to, to understand where might be an opportunity to enhance that experience or turn it into more of a positive. So uh, we then we went back into the forums. We had additional questions where we were able to view the virtual shopping and remote usability. Uh, really to wrap up the research. Um, this, this is an example of how remote usability um, scenario would look like. Uh, this, is, this will be kind of a, a view of what the client would see and the moderator would see. Uh, it's not really specific to this project. It is about shopping, but it's something that we wanted to show you to see how it looks. Um, in this one, we, had, we gave her a task of shopping for a gift, and um, she chose a watch. So, Again, you'll watch her going through the motions and going for the Okay, so I know I like the brand Citizen, and even though I won't buy it from them, um, I will like I like to look at their pricing first and to see what they have in stock there at their um, website. And you, you're I saying you won't it, buy it from them. Who do you buy it from? Usually, I'll buy it from. Uh, another retail store such as JCPenney or Macy's or from a jeweler because their pricing is usually cheaper. So what are you trying to accomplish by looking at the citizen site? What are you looking for? I just make sure I can find a style. Usually they have every style they have and if I can find it there and find it at another store, I'll buy it from another store or find one that looks the closest to it if I can't find that exact watch. Okay. So I'll go to Gold Tone. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, it's it's just a few more seconds left. I thought we, for time purposes, that just gives you kind of a taste of, you know, and you would as a client uh, can call in from your office uh, and watch on the computer and watch it live as it happens. Uh, when we can have a back room, much like we have. Uh, in an in-person uh, location where you could upload any probes or anything. So we use this again for uh, website usability and also, um, you know, in a bit broader sense, shopping behaviors and online. Um, so some of the things that we learned in this case study, yeah, you kind of got it, uh, were, were about the virtual shopping. You know, with this technology, we have the ability to turn it over to the respondent, and they are more and more comfortable to do so now that they have a camera, a video recorder basically a computer in their hand. This allows us to see into their world, to learn how they normally shop without us actually being there, while also being in that moment and, and you know, could possibly bias in their experiences if we're standing next to them. There's nothing wrong with observational in-person research, but there is sometimes some real positives about virtually being there. Um, similarly, you know, the remote usability allowed us to peek into their world while they were in their environment using their computer. We got to listen in and peek over their shoulder, so to speak, watched how they shop online. Um, we've done this research in labs and facilities, uh, but the remote aspect of it is a big advantage to get more in-depth look at their behaviors. So, so this approach uh, really helped us to get a comprehensive look at the retail and online shopping, at how they experience the store in person. It allowed us to look at all aspects. This was a very successful for our client, and they, they took our insights from this approach uh, to focus in on how to improve their shopping experience, uh, minimizing negatives and frustrations and help them create, you know, ultimately traffic and loyalty uh, by designing a store and an online experience that fit their brand and strengthen their brand. So I'll turn it over to Clay for final conclusions. Thanks, Roger. Um, just to kind of close up, we want to just kind of tell you a few points about fusion research. And a fusion research approach above all is fun. It, it's a great way to understand and thoroughly identify the needs, the wants, the concerns of your consumer. You know, Fusion Research Approach is focused on answering the objectives and goals of the research, but it also looks at those issues necessary to understand the objectives. So it's looking at all of the relevant um, identifiers that are going to be needed to understand what is going to solve your problem. 
Fusion Research provo approach provides a comprehensive and in-depth look at the consumer's perceptions and behaviors. It really peels the onion from multiple ways in order to give you the best insights that you can get about your consumer, their purchase processes, the decisions they make, and their actual behaviors. The approach acknowledges the strengths and weaknesses of the various methodologies, and it utilizes the most appropriate combination of methods. We know that the different methodologies have different strengths and weaknesses. Fusion Research acknowledges that, and it puts together a program that will give you an answer all of the objectives and goals that you have for your research. And finally, you know, a Fusion Research approach is not necessary for every endeavor, but when you have a complex initiative, when you need a deep understanding, maybe of in, moment, in the moment as well as in-depth perceptions, Fusion Research Approach can ultimately give you the answers that you need. With that, we have just a few minutes for any questions from participants. Okay, I think I got one here. Um, I'll just read it out loud and you can, okay. All right. uh, so, so for mixed mode, uh, do you use the same or different respondents? You know, it depends, and I hate to say it like that, but it truly does depend on what your goals of the research are. Um, you know, the big thing about it is to think if um, one piece of the research is going to influence another piece of the research. So if you need to have more um, uninfluenced um, input from the different methodologies, then you definitely want to have different people coming in. A lot of times, though, in a lot of activities, we want to have the same group of people in more of a longitudinal process. Often what we will do is we'll have consumers talk about their perceptions of the brand, um, maybe in a bulletin board or in a focus group. They will talk about kind of the decision-making processes they go through to get to the store um, and to choose ultimately kind of choose the product. But then we take them to the store environment for their actual behaviors and observation of their behaviors and to get their insights into the situation that they're literally in at that point of purchase or even at that point of usage in some cases. All right, great. Um, let's see here. All right, so uh, i got another one. Can we do usability research on phone apps? Um, yeah, and I, I think I might have touched on or I might have mentioned it, but yes, we have done um, usability uh, when people are using their smartphones. Um, I do know that, uh, hold on here, yeah, I know that, um, that that technology hasn't always been around, uh, so it's something that's been recently developed, uh, but it is something that we have started doing, and, and we're, you know, we're real careful to say no on, on technology-related things because we are constantly looking and exploring um, you know, new and emerging technologies because things do change and they think they, they change overnight. So we are we are always looking for ways to to reach the uh, to reach the user in a more um, you know efficient way. So um, we have another one. Do you want to? Yeah. The question is, what you're thinking about doing this as a layered simultaneous approach? In other words, doing both qual and quant at the same time. You know. And there are some endeavors where we will use qual and quant at the same time. Um, often those are because of time constraints to, to get the project done. We often, we do a good bit of our work is a qual quant initiative. And typically we're using qual A either to um, provide fodder, if you will, or insights for the quantitative study. Um, it's more of an exploratory type of um, qualitative endeavor or we're using the, quantit the qualitative after the quantitative to really bring those insights from the quantitative to life. Um, if it's, for example, a segmentation um, to develop the personas that were a result of those um, segmentations. Um, it also depends on if you're looking for very different aspects from the qualitative and quantitative. If they're two really standalone unique pieces, we will do those um, at the same time. And then the analysis is really kind of where the, the results are fused together or um, are given to give a more complete picture. All right, I think we, I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, uh, let's see. Um, are there one or two techniques that are, you know, a core part of a hybrid approach or one that you may or may not use all the time? Or does it vary greatly? 
Nice. You know what? It it varies greatly, actually. Um, I think one of the the core ideas, maybe if you will, between um, a hybrid approach is this idea of in depth and in the moment. Um, and so often, what we will do is do a um, a technique, whether it's a bulletin board, maybe a focus group, that is designed to give a more in depth response to more more insights. Maybe it's the decision making process. Maybe it is just to get a better understanding of all of the relevant issues. And then a follow-up or a second part of that hybrid approach would be more of an in-the-moment aspect, um, whether it's diary entries or a shopping occasion. Um, once we um, viewed um, uh, consumers making a, a, um, a meal for their family, for example, um, to get those insights in real time. And, and um, it, this was a virtual um, ethnography, if you will, where we had cameras set up within the home um, without a ethnographer present. So I think one of the, the key things is really to kind of understand that in depth and in the moment tends to be more of the, the core pieces of hybrid approaches, um, but the methods and the techniques can vary greatly between that. All right, I think that's all the time we have for now. I'm gonna turn the time back over to Christy. All right, thank you for the wonderful presentation today, and thank you everyone for attending today's Insider Series webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email either Clay or Roger. Our next Insider Series webinar will be Wednesday, August 10th. Decision Analyst Jerry Thomas, President CEO, and John Colius, Senior Vice President of Advanced Analytics, will be presenting Optimization with Choice Modeling. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation presentation and are looking forward to seeing you for next month's webinar. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.